the quality. Sorry for the cycle. Similar effect here, even though it's not a striker green. Hey, hey everyone, welcome to the video. Today, you find me not at High Plains Raceway and not even in Colorado, but near Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. Specifically, you find me at Road America. Yes, that Road America for a very special event, the Viper Days Reunion. Viper Days was an old, high-performance driving school aimed specifically at Viper owners so they could get to know their snakes a little bit better. Started by Skip Thomas, you were provided a safe, controlled environment to push your machine to the limit, whilst also having the benefit of professional instruction for both basic car control and whatever track Viper Days was being held at. If you were good enough, or perhaps confident enough, you could even compete in time trials. This mitigated the dangers involved with wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing, yet also allowed for some friendly competition, a brilliant balance for those who wanted more of a challenge. And that was the beauty of Viper Days. It had HPDE-style driver instruction and lessons, while also having time trials not unlike those at an SCCA or NASA event. It had something for the novice newbie and snake-bitten track rat all at the same time. It was so popular, in fact, and owners clamored for it so much that the Viper Racing League was introduced later down the line, adding that wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing component for more experienced Viper pilots. In essence, you'd start in Viper Days and work your way up to the Viper Racing League if you so chose. Sadly, thanks to financial troubles, the Viper Racing League got sold off and turned into NARA, the North American Road Racing Association. And while Viper Days would continue on and off throughout the years, the last event was held in 2015. That's why, when I saw they were having a reunion in August, I freaked out at the idea they were bringing back a historic Viper event. Let me level with you guys. I didn't even think I'd get to go this year. I was just happy an event from Viper history was being resurrected. Sure, it would have been my first time seeing a competition coupe in person. It'd be my first time at Road America, and Vipers I had only seen on Instagram would be there. But I genuinely didn't think I'd manage to fly out for what was quickly shaping up to be the wonderful multi-day Viper event of my dreams. But clearly and thankfully, I did. So let's not delay this or me any further. Let's go check out those Vipers. To start, I want to talk about this Copperhead Orange Comp 2. Viper aficionados will be able to immediately recognize that this is an early Comp 2, thanks to the difference in the front bumper here and in the size of the rear wing at the back. Comp hoops that look like this were meant for club racing, so not full on professional racing, but people that like to take their racing to the next level. For people that thought the ACR just wasn't racy enough. If we look at the wheel and tire package up front, we see that the tires are 325s, or 325 section fronts, around 18 inch wheels. 325s on the front. That's near Viper size rear tires on the front. That has got to provide some insane turn in. And then if we go back here, much the same. 325 section rear tires on 18 inch wheels. That means the comp coupes don't have a staggered setup like on production bikers because the Gen 5 is 295 section front tires on 355 section rears. The Gen 4, I think, had two seven non ACRs, had three had two 75 section front tires on 18 inch wheels, and I think three four fives at the rear. So again, unlike the production bikers, these aren't staggered. Interesting. Different. I'm actually rather surprised. I did not know that. And the car behind me, the comp coupe behind me, that's also behind the camera, has the same setup. Hmm. Oh yes, everyone. I am standing next to a GT3R. And not just any GT3R, but Ben Keating's GT3R. This car actually ran at the 24 hours of Daytona back in 2015. With Ben Keating, Dominic Barnbacher, Luba Whipper, and Al Carter behind the wheel, piloting his very GT3 to the win. Oh my god, look at this. Those of us that have seen a GT3R or a GT, GTSR know that it's a little bit wider than the production car, but when you see it in the flesh, it's like, 
That's a wide body cam. That's like the A10 wide body auto form, but racing, racing on. and the like, which means that this is basically a Viper GTSR with a much more powerful engine that you could buy back in 2014, 2015 for about $480,000. Because it's a full on race car, that means you get the, as we saw in later GTSRs actually, from at least the 2015 season onward, you get the bigger canard and the bigger rear wing. If you want an example of how serious a piece of kit this is, Zach Speed currently races one in the VLN series in Germany. This is a race car. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And here is the car I was most jazzed about seeing on the entry list. I've been following this thing on the Viper Force for ages. I followed the Instagram account. I've been watching every single post. And now I'm seeing it in the clutch. It is just as crazy. As you'll notice, no headlights, no weight on the front, weight production, weight in the interior. Paddleship, it, it, it is a sequential shift, right? Six XDs, front of transmission. And this takes a 9 liter extreme to the extreme. It is the, if this were a kid, it would be known as Max Venom. If this were a person, people would be asking for a gym routine. Most 9 liter extreme vipers make 825 horsepower at the crank, around 770 at the wheels. This viper, on the other hand, makes well, around 900 at the crank? Yeah. 900 at the crank, 803 horsepower at the rear wheels. Not only that, not only does it have more horsepower than a normal 9 liter extreme viper, normal 9 liter extreme viper. This car takes weight reduction for a street car to a whole new level. Cable is taking so much weight out of it that it weighs around 2,900 pounds, 2,800. Can you imagine that power to weight ratio? And God only knows the torque. The force pulling torque that this car has. 2,900 pounds, 803 rear wheel horsepower. And 770 pound feet of torque? Yeah, it's about 700 at the wheels. 700 pound feet of torque at the wheels. It's a monster. I actually was able to get a little peek at the time sheet yesterday, and this car, this very car, was only behind one other. Ben Keating's GT3R. If that doesn't tell you how fast this thing is, I don't think anything else will. And not only that, we have to increase red line. Asking in the presence of so many Viper race cars really is something special. It was kind of like being the ghost of Christmas past. In the sense of feeling like I was literally walking through a Viper event held 10 years ago. Except I was very much in the present, as evidenced by all the Gen 5 Vipers around. The surreal nature of it all was heightened when the Vipers hit the racetrack as well. Ben Keating's GT3R man, it was utterly euphoric. Possessing a beautiful and unique coarseness that few other Vipers had. Cable's 9-liter Max Venom Viper was unmistakable even from several yards away. 
no doubt the result of a 3 plus inch diameter exhaust and a much higher redline than most other Vipers. Then there was the surprisingly loud Red Gen 2 that was doing its best GTSR impression with all the aero bits and the shortened exhaust. Enough voiceover though, I'll shut up now so you can hear the cars in full and uninterrupted.
We interrupt your regularly scheduled Viper programming for this weather bulletin. Wait, wait, I've gone too far. Let's rewind a little bit. Now at this moment, what I'd like to do is transition over to some videos where I talk about Road America, but I can't. Partly because I was so preoccupied with all the Viper stuff, I didn't take the time out to record anything about Road America, but also because of some weather complications. See for yourself. Threatens everything! Threatens everything indeed. On Friday, right around lunchtime, all hell broke loose. That monstrous cloud cover, the general blueness of the whole world, plus the sense of panic around getting all the vipers into shelter. It really looked and felt like a massive weather front, possibly doomsday, was heading our way, and the snakes would be right in the middle of it. Me and Stephanie were at the carousel when she heard the announcement over the megaphone that everyone needed to seek shelter, and it was pretty easy to see why. From what I can guess and recall, the Vipers were literally on pit lane while this weather front stormed in. I wasn't there at the time, like I said, we were at the carousel, so I can only guess that the owners of these cop coops were notified of the impending doom, or saw it for themselves, and quickly took action to shield their snakes, which you'll see a part of soon, from the incoming influx of sky tears. What surprised me, and surprises me even now looking at the footage, is how many street vipers were caught out in the rush as well. The streetcar time trial group weren't the ones up for that session. The track car group was. So why there were so many streetcars also on the main entrance road is beyond me. In any case, all the vipers thankfully made it through the storm unscathed. And with that little bit of context out of the way, let's get back to that bulletin. The river, not river, <laughs> I mean it is a river now. But the tunnel that you use to get into Road America has flooded. I'm not joking, it just rained. We had torrential downpour just a minute ago. Didn't record it because I was way too worried about getting it in shelter. I should have swapped and then recorded a little bit of it. But I mean, look, it is wet, so you can see I'm not lying. But it has legitimately flooded. It has legitimately flooded at the tunnel. And we're about to go see it. So. This normally wouldn't be part of the video, but as you can probably imagine, it's uh, been a little trying, shall we say, to get content because we've been intermittently trying to deal with rain and distance and all that sort of stuff. So we're going to go check that out. I really wish I had a golf cart right now because this is a bit of a long walk, but uh, this is going to be, uh, I guess this is going to be worth it for all the wrong reasons. And that is why we can't have nice things. That it, there's actually something stuck in the middle there. I don't even know what it is. No, that's the screen. Oh, it's the screen? Okay. From here, it looks like a shopping cart to me. There's a screen so that it keeps the debris out of there from plugging up. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. So like I said, this is why we can't have nice things. Um, the Supercell looks like it's going back the other way, and I really hope it's not. It better not be. That is... wow. Before I end though, I need to tell you all about one more Viper and the racing snake historian who got the chance of a lifetime to drive it. Let's start with the car first. Now at this point, some of you might be saying, but Cody, this, this car looks familiar. This livery looks familiar. And you might, because this very car was actually the, I guess, the prototype that Dodger used back in 2002, I think it was. This is that press car. Press car from the press photo. Except it might not be because it's actually two. Because this one another that looks exactly like it. I don't know what this went. But one of these, one of these in this very livery, is that same car we've all seen in the press photos. How cool is that? And now for the interview. This is Sean Romig. He is the owner of a gorgeous Viper Red Metallic Gen 4 ACR. He is the godfather of the Viper Racing History website. He is exceedingly humble. And because of that, he is also the mayor of Chad Studdington, Pennsylvania. 
and he graciously agreed to tell me what it was like to drive this competition coupe known as Prototype 4. So Sean, how was your, yeah. how was your experience with the competition? Was it was your first time out in this thing on track in North America? It was not only my first time in this kind of coupe, it was my first time in North America ever. Oh wow. And the first lap of the weekend. Oh god. So there was a lot to take in with a lot of legendary cars going really quickly. But the objective was just to keep it safe, experience a piece of bike racing history, have a good time. And so far, so good. Oh, awesome, awesome. For those who don't know, because I've i just come back, sort of, like 30 minutes ago, I came back when I'm riding with Max Jules in the TRX. And there is no, like, there's hardly a gravel trap. I think that last turn was kind of the only place you maybe turn one, and that's about it. Yeah, there's, there's not a lot of margin for error, but that's why people respect that America so much. It's an old school track that has consequences. That's what draws people here, I think, to run it. It's intimidating, but if you want to do it, you feel like you accomplished something. No matter how fast you're going, just keeping it safe and getting a little speed, it's a lot of fun. I can't wait to come back. It hasn't even ended yet. But I already know I can't wait to come back. Yeah, I'm exactly the same way. So what were, what were your initial impressions driving? Because you didn't go 10-10, but I bet you gave it a little bit of gas. Yeah, initially, uh, it's interesting. One, we kind of have a compromised seating position between the uh, driver that owns the car, Mark Odell, awesome guy, but I'm so thankful to have the opportunity to have He's a little shorter than I am, so we're kind of in the middle. So when I went for turn one, my elbow hit the trans tunnel, and I was like, oh, you know, I'm trying to do one of these jobs. And uh, the car brakes really well, so when I hit the brake, I broke way too soon. Oh, you, Mark, I, I, could, I could coast into the corner. So there's going to be some calibration there. Um, the car is... You can tell all the work that the Dodge engineers and Tommy Archer and Matt Carr and Terry Jones, all these guys, the work they did to make it uh, a club racer for the everyday. Pump that money, have a safe car, it does everything. You know, you can tell right you're comfortable with. It doesn't feel like it's going to bite you. Uh, it gives you a nice platform to learn. But, you know, there's a lot to learn. The motion braking was very good. Uh, I got to figure out muscle memory now with how I can not run my elbow and my knee and things. Yeah, yeah. Um, the car sounds awesome, like most uh, hypers do. And the other thing I got to figure out is. You know, I'm not even sure I'm going to get there this weekend, but how much can you use the arrow? Do I have the confidence to use the arrow yeah, on somebody yeah. else's car? And uh, other than that, you know, it's pretty straightforward. It's, it's like the other Vipers I've been fortunate to drive. It uh, inspires confidence, and it's just awesome. You, know, you start that thing up on the, on the pit wall and shake in, and yeah. you look out the windshield, and the vent heat is going by you in an Daytona winning car. It doesn't yeah, really yeah. get much better than that. Whether you're quick or not. So, uh, ben looked fun. insane driving yeah. that GT3R. He was so fast. Yeah, I mean, Ben doing a 205 on like his first hot lap. Oh, God! It's pretty amazing to see that car unrestricted. I think he went 208 back on the race time. So it was a restricted. He was in the second. I actually hope I can get out of the way and let him sail on the really fast lap that we can all enjoy. So how does how does this compare to your Gen 4 race car? Because obviously this is a this is pretty much as close to a race car you're going to get this side of a GT3 R, and your ACR is a Gen 4 production. Right. Well, this is a factory race car. Uh, this is P4. It was the last prototype that they built and actually used for endurance testing to develop the production of the The major difference is this has substantially less power than my new car. Yeah. Uh, and actually, mine has a modified power drive ratio. So, steering wise, also, this doesn't have the, the acceleration that my street car does. But it weighs less, and it's stiffer. So, when you turn the wheel, even though an ACR is incredible, this is still tighter. You know, it responds quicker, it rolls less, and we don't really have a soap dialed in by any means, it's just as you know, it is. But even there, you can tell right away, uh, even the, the meanest ACR street cars, when you sit in a real race car, you, know, you can feel it right away. There's no compromise. It's very stiff and you know, it wants to do one thing. So uh, that's the initial impression that uh, I just gotta figure out how to have less horsepower than I'm used to. I'll be able to break a lot later. Yeah, so you're not having to coast in the corner. So I, used, I used to race on an old, thing called Race 07. It was an old simulator by Simbin. Yeah. And I, mean, I was doing it on a crappy laptop, so I was always breaking through it. But there's, there is nothing slower than having to accelerate into the corner to then break again. Yeah, having to coast into it, it's like, oh man, it's, you just you just miss. Right, exactly. And there's no way to fix it. No, but Alex said I only have one session. So yeah. I have to figure all that out. We'll get a few more this weekend. And Maybe I can improve a little bit while still being safe. Yeah, I mean, for one session and bringing the car in one piece, yeah, that's still awesome. the way I thought. It would have been I have to do some maintenance tonight, so it might be a long night. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> but so far, so good otherwise. At least with the night, it won't be terribly hot. Or no, no, no. We 
actually running different tires in the session, so another variable to learn. Okay, are you, is it a different pump? Uh, it's totally a different manufacturer. They were our sevens on before, and now we're running some Michelin. So I didn't, it's going to be another learning experience. Yeah. Are they three two fives or actually did, these are these are metric sizes? Yeah. Um, I think it's a thirty three sixty eight eighteen on the rear. I actually have to look at the front. I didn't see what part to put on. Uh, 3065, 18 on the front. Okay. So the sizing's a little different than it might be. Yeah, because I looked at the other top groups and they all run 3.65 all the way around, which I found really surprising because most Vipers have a staggered setup. 3.55, right. so back in, in Viper days and Viper Racing League, they had a limitation to kind of keep everyone kind of equal in speeds where they specify for certain classes, certain tires, for compound and width. So uh, a square setup is often run in certain classes of Viper days, which you know we're here to celebrate. Yeah. Yeah, that might be why you saw that. Okay, that, that would explain that. So, as a Viper historian, there can't be much much else cooler than being next to the prototype that was in the early yeah, official. Yeah, certainly. So, I had the magazines this car was in when they launched them in 2002 and three. Yep. And uh, I was really excited when Mark bought the car. You know, we'd be coming back out, and then I couldn't believe that he would actually say, "Hey, you want to come drive this?" Yeah. I was like, "What?" And I spent a lot of time trying to find the history, and then to get to actually experience the history is pretty hard to beat. So I'm pretty thankful and uh, just enjoying the weekend with everyone. There's so many great guys here. Yeah. It's it's lifetime, lifetime, lifetime experience for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. In 2002. Depending yeah, on when in 2002, that means I was only a few months old oh, at that yeah. time. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I was already a teenager, but yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. Well, thank you for allowing me to talk to you and ask you about what it was like to experience the competition because that's really a once in a lifetime experience if you don't own one. It certainly is. Yeah, it's been great talking. It's been fun having you here this weekend. I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun tonight and tomorrow. Yes, so. yeah, not over really yet. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Take care. In short, then, geeking out tons of racing, unexpected weather severity, and an awesome interview with one of the most knowledgeable people of Viper race cars on the planet. Sounds like a pretty solid basis for having a good time, and boy did I ever. To say it was worth flying out would be a disgusting understatement. And what you saw in this video isn't even everything that happened. Oh no, I've still got much more footage to piece together. So stay tuned for the Viper Days Reunion Part 2 video. In the meantime though, I hope you enjoyed what you saw here. If you did, then please like, comment, share, and consider subscribing. And if you do subscribe, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Please hit the little notification bell and all notifications that way you're notified every time I upload. I will see you all next time. Oh, yeah.